Okay, so how will, I guess we're set up, <coughs> how we'll kind of run this, I suppose, without having talked to your cowboy beforehand. Um, it's I'll just sort of run through and try to do a bit of crystal ball gazing, which I'm usually better in hindsight than I am the other way. Um, so I'll just sort of run through, you know, some thoughts I've had of what challenges that we're going to be facing. Um, in the industry due to weed um, and um, I guess the idea is just to you know try and promote some discussion and you know you'll probably pick on plenty of things that I've missed or things that you may not think are an issue that I've raised so a bit of an outline I've got here um, so I guess I'll start with where we are now what's our current status so a little bit of look into what resistance is present and I guess one thing in the back you could keep in the back of your minds is for what herbicides we're using now, um, when you think to the future, if we're relying on those herbicides, well, they're going to be the ones that are going to you know, give us risks in the future. So what we do in the future is related to what we're doing now. Um, what's going to change? Herbicide use patterns that may change and already probably have started to change. A um, little bit on new technologies. What are the future risks with resistance? and I'd slightly touch on target site and non-target site resistance, very basically, because that's about all I can understand. And, you know, what are some of the likely weeds? So I just thought I'd sort of throw up there sort of where we are now in terms of resistance, and this is across Australia. This is just not cotton, so don't, don't get too alarmed by the numbers. But you can see those weeds there. Um, they're all ones we have in our paddocks, and the incidence of those, in particular for us, um, barnyard grass and fleabane are uh, ones that you know a lot of people are dealing with. We now, you know, when I first came onto the scene, you know, we heard a lot about ryegrass and down south, and you know, kind of thought that wasn't really going to pose us an issue. But the industry's crept south, and so, and ryegrass may have even, you know, steadily crept north. So now that's an issue that we're facing, and. You're looking, when you're looking at that, you're looking at resistance to multiple herbicide groups, not just glyphosate. So that's going to pose you know, some real challenges for us as a whole industry in the future. The other one I've got down there is Feathertop Road Grass. You won't find it on any resistance list because it's not on the Roundup label, but it's definitely displaying all the characteristics um, of resistance. And we're, we're learning a bit more about it ourselves in the um, project that we've got, which is funded by CRDC. So that's one thing that we're also a bit concerned about. So what herbicides are we relying on? Well, without having any you know, full-on data to back this up, but we all know how much you know, Redis planted, which is most of the industry, so glyphosate still dominates. But what about some of the other herbicides? And we start thinking about them, and when we start getting glyphosate resistance creeping in and growers having to deal with that, well, that puts pressure on our other herbicides. So you think about summer grasses, so, you know, things like banyo, feather top. We're using our group A's to control them. And they're, you know, they're the herbicide group that has the highest resistance risk. So that, you know, that poses a big risk to the industry, you know, especially if there are those that have survived group A applications. Increased reliance on double knock, so that's for flea bane, um, barnyard grass and probably other weeds we're using it for. How good are our double knocks? Are we getting 100% control after that paraquat application? So, you know, I guess amongst the research is that resistance to paraquat, or, you know, slash spray seed, is it something we are slightly concerned about? Our increased use of residuals, there's a couple of examples there, um, diuron, pendamethyl and metolachlor. You know, we, we all know they're, they're pretty hard to use to get consistent control and if you get poor control, sometimes it's hard to identify why. Mostly it's going to be application, rainfall, some other factor, but to pick up a resistance issue is often a bit harder than it can be for a post-emergent herbicide. And then are we managing our escapes? Group G herbicides, so we're seeing a bit of an increase in use of those, and we don't fully understand those. We're, you know, they're having a few issues with some of those in the US, so... Um, I just threw that in there as one that we need to be thinking about. So you can see there's a little bit of a common theme in there to do with survivors, and I'll, I'll keep touching on survivors as we go through. So what does this mean? Um, a bit of data I found, it's a, a few years old now, but um, in terms of managing glyphosate resistance, um, the information you know, 
of the increased costs from doing that. It did range, I've got to say, from like zero to over, I think over $100, and there was, you know, quite a number of different, um, you know, numbers within that. But, you know, on a pretty rough average, you know, you could probably say 60 to $80 per hectare that some growers are facing. So some growers are facing none, some growers are facing more as that additional cost. What I haven't factored in there is the additional cost for labour. So weed management strategies, you know, are probably looking to be um, a bit more intensive. So more time, time to ensure we get effective applications, time to monitor, to go through the paddocks to look for survivors and then time to control those survivors. I haven't put up there time to manage our cha channels um, and fence lines. One of the main messages that I got from the US with what they were facing over there was, you know, there was a few growers who were telling us that they either had to increase capacity, um, they had to, you know, run more spray rigs, they had to probably reduce the amount of cotton they had so they could manage it, or they had to just change crops because it was too hard to deal with their palm remoranth um, with their system. So they had to go, you know, either get right out or scale right down. So that's not going to happen here, hopefully, but that's some of the things that they're going through. We're starting to see residuals used a bit more in fallow and, you know, we sort of faced with labour limitations on that. What residuals do we actually have that are registered for actual fallow use rather than pre-crop use? What's going to change? Well, I guess steadily more of the same. We're looking at, you know, controlling grass herbicides and you know, controlling flea bane, so more pressure on the, the group A herbicides, the phenoxies, so your group I's and your group G herbicides, more pressure on the, the pre-emergent herbicides, you know, your pendamethalin, your triazines, um, and your metolachlor, and more pressure on paraquat. And so what we're seeing when we're starting to have to manage some of these weeds in the fallows, in the summer fallows, that some of the herbicides that we're using in the crops can be similar to what we're using in the fallows to try and get on top of that. So that does put a bit of pressure on our herbicide rotation when we're relying on herbicides. The grape A resistance to summer grasses, I've, I've brought it up a couple of times already, but you know we're kind of expecting to hear any moment of where we've got someone that's got group A resistance to, to barnyard grass or, or feather top or something. Just so that, you know, it only, it only takes a few goes with a group A and resistance can occur, as we've seen uh, with ryegrass and with other weeds. A lot of dyer on use, flea bane, so that's a concern we have as well. And I raised the point about our double knocks. And I guess another little question I have in the back of my mind is how come we haven't seen 2,4-D resistance in flea bane and south thistle? I guess glyphosate's being used a lot, so we're seeing glyphosate resistance pop up. Um, what could be happening there? It's good that we haven't found anything yet. So what's going to change? Well. We start thinking about some of the new trades coming in or likely to come in. So we've got glyphosate um, and dicamba, which is some of the ones that we've, we've probably talked mostly about. Um, glyphosate, previously underutilised for a lot of reasons, which you all, would all know. Um, once we get it in a crop, um, and it can be widely, you know, it's widely planted to have that trait, it gives us potential, you know, to use that herbicide more. So there's there's potential benefits there on, you know, some of the harder to control weeds, um, probably the vines, um, and to use. I'm looking at, you know, using it as a double knock. So we can use a double knock in in crop um, as an alternative to using paraquat. The other one is dicamba. Um, you know, it's been used mainly in winter cereals. You know, there's been a little bit of summer fallow use, but it hasn't been, you know, it's pretty hasn't been used a lot, so that's good. But I guess what we don't really understand is um, previous group I use, like 2,4-D or picloram or you know, some of that. You know, is there any chance for that to confer across resistance to that camber? It's, it's probably very small, but things like that can happen. So you know, there are obvious benefits there for broadleaf weeds with that technology. With the grasses, it's probably a bit more limited in terms of those. But the effectiveness of them, as with the straight round of pretty trait, will depend on how much rotation of other things, whether it's cultivation, residual herbicides, controlling survivors, the success of that uh, will depend on 
those things just as the success of Roundup Ready has. So yeah, survivor is still going to be very important. Um, you know, there's potential, and you know, Tony or someone might be able to correct me or um, go into this a bit more if we want to, of using, um, of adding like HPPDs, so Group H and Group G trait into, into a crop. You know, what are the implications of that? So as part of Tim's, we've started a discussion paper that's looking at some of this stuff. It's, I guess it's at the moment it's probably based a bit around um, the dicamba, glyphosinate, glyphosate stack. Um, but that's now going to be is, um, led by Sadesh Manolil, and he's going to go into that more. And so we can sort of you know, bring together and, and get an understanding of what we might be facing in the future. So when we look at some of the future risks in terms of target site risk, well, they're a bit more predictable. Um, it's fairly easy, well, not coming from me, speaking of someone who does that sort of thing, to go in and find, you know, if we have a problem, to go in and find a target site change is fairly easy um, to do. And you can pretty much, you know, herbicides you use are the herbicides that are likely to get resistance, I suppose. So it's kind of easy to predict because they are quite specific. Though I guess the confounding factor is they can confer cross resistance to other herbicides. And an example of that is, um, need to finish. So yeah, so, you know, there was an example in the US of where they had been using triazines in seed corn. They came in and the first time they used a HPPD, they already had resistance to it. So, you know, there's things that can happen. Non-target stuff, harder to predict. You know, lots of different mechanisms going on, translocation, phys phenological, physiological differences, harder to work out. So there's a list, don't really look at it too much, but um, you know, there are weeds that are, have non-target side things, so enzymes that are breaking down the herbicides, transporting herbicides into a vacuole, stopping herbicide getting in. And I guess one thing we're interested in now, we have a flea bone population, which we've been working with, um, with some James Herwood in, in, working at UQ has found that it doesn't have a target site change, though it's resistant. So we've got to try and work out well, what's going on to give it that resistance. The weeds, fairly similar. You know, we can discuss that if you want to. Um, probably it's what we're looking at now. Summer grass is the big risk, but there's always others that pop up that we don't think about. So looking forward, I guess from where where I'm thinking at the moment, you know, field monitoring is viable, it's still very important. And we could probably assume that the 2 plus 2 plus 0 strategy that we're using for glyphosate can apply when we have more herbicides or more traits or, or things. So, I mean, we haven't done any modelling to look at that yet and we are planning to do that um, in, in time. So, yeah, that would be interesting to see. And I guess the main message is don't wait for new traits. Um, we need to be in the best position we can be before they come along. So that's all I had. Um, hopefully that promotes some kind of discussion or otherwise. So. <laughs>